So welcome to another six pattern video. My name is Max. I'm Kevin. And today we're just going to look at a, a quick interesting case that uh, that at least scares me somewhat and should scare most people. So this was a patient, 65 year old male, who was being followed for a UIP of IPF diagnosis, which was done radiographically. Right. And the patient ended up developing some increasing hazy infiltrates, mostly on the right side. Wow. So localized progressive infiltrates in a patient with all known diagnosed clinical idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Clinical and radiographic diagnosed right. idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the question from the clinicians is, is this patient having an acute exacerbation of the usual interstitial pneumonia of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and that's why the infiltrate's there? Or is this a disease process other than UIP of IPF? They're starting to scratch their heads and saying, maybe we're dealing with something that's not UIP of IPF. Like infection. Like infection, exactly. Or something superimposed on UIP of IPF, like infection. So this came upper, middle, and lower lobe biopsies. So it was a, it was a, a typical ILD biopsy. These were the lower lobes. So this biopsy is, again, clearly abnormal. Uh, we've got large continents of scar evidenced by pink eosinophilic fibrosis, wiry, dense collagen, dense collagen. So I, I'm thinking this is a fibrotic lung disease. So I'm okay with this being an IPF. Uh, no matter how we made the diagnosis, I, I would say this is kind of advanced fibrosis. Most of the time, it's going to be UIP of IPF, right. but this it almost looks like in-stage lung. I mean, there's probably yeah. some honeycomb remodeling here. Yeah. I mean, this is yeah. this is advanced fibrosis. Yeah. So the question on a biopsy like that is, did we just get an area of advanced end-stage lung in a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? If so, have we helped them at all? Probably not. Because probably the, the not. The real question is, what are what are these infiltrates about here in right. this patient? Right. So it's time for us to go into our type two thinking. Yeah. So what could give you infiltrates? Well, we got to look for infection. Features of infection, necrosis, granulomas, neutrophils. We got to look for acute exacerbation, which might be an organizing pneumonia separate from scar or, or next to it. DAD with hyaline membranes right. near scar. What else? Well, some patients with fibrotic lung disease seem to be at higher risk for cancer. Probably because they're getting a lot of scarring, a lot of inflammation, there's a lot of cellular turnover, kind of like the liver model, where you get a lot of turnover, you end up uh, increasing your risk for, for mutation. An asbestos model for mesothelioma. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, if we're looking for tumors here, uh, we do have some glandular epithelium, but this might just be peribronchial or metaplasia. Yeah, whenever I see glandular epithelium in the lung, with or without uh, mucus, uh, I, I go up and look at the epithelium, and I should be able to see cilia on at least half of the cells in any field. So right. if I've got 50 cells, I should be able to see distinct terminal bars and cilia. And there might be a little bit of cilia right there. Yeah, it looks like there's something distinct underneath that. Maybe it's one ciliated cell. Yeah, maybe a little bit of cilia in this little strip of, of right. cells here. So let's look at some other strips. So well, look at those pale cells. Those are, that's unusual. Ciliated epithelium in the lung generally doesn't have this pale appearance to the cytoplasm. Yeah, like mucin vacuoles. And mucin vacuoles. So don't we have mucinous cells in the lung, Max? You can have goblet cell metaplasia all the time. Right. So if you have this possibility of having normal mucinous cells or metaplastic mucinous cells, how are you going to ever diagnose a mucinous adenocarcinoma in this setting? Well, there's some stains we could do. But right. before we get into those stains, I, I, I think we could make a few cytologic comments here. Right. And, and maybe a few architectural comments. Right. This looks like a, a papilla. Right. Right. It's got a central core. It's got a central core. There's probably a vascular structure in there. This looks like a papilla. And so your peribronchiolar metaplasia shouldn't be forming papillary type projections into luminal spaces. Correct. So I'm a little bit worried architecturally yep. here. Yep. Good. Now, the other thing I'm worried about cytologically is that, you know, most 
peribronchiolar metaplasia retains a very nice degree of polarity. Right. And while some of these cells are nice, the nuclei are nice and basally oriented, what is that guy doing? And, and to your point, if you look to the left, there's a goblet cell with with a very long column of cytoplasm, look at the size of the nucleus at the base of that goblet cell compared to these monsters. So it, when you're in the middle of big nuclei, it's hard to have perspective yeah. on how out of place they are. But, so but the, the contrast is helpful. The contrast when you have them next to each other is dramatic and speaks volumes. Also, my general rule is no more than three mucinous cells in a row. Right, and here we have entire strips of mucinous cells like this, one after another after another. So, Max, I'm going to tell you, if I got that in a transbronchial biopsy, I would diagnose mucinous adenocarcinoma. Right, because it would be in a whole different setting. You wouldn't be worrying about interstitial lung disease. Right. So, if we wanted to, like you were saying, here's even a cribriform structure for crying out loud. So, if we wanted to help, uh, you know, Perhaps this might be a little bit of a shock to the clinicians if we wanted to help um, calm their fears down a little bit. We could do some immunohistochemical stains here that might help this uh, help confirm our impression here. And not a mucin stain. And not a mucin stain. Well, we need, <laughs> I mean, you we can do a mucin stain if you want to do a mucin stain, but it's not going to be helpful in the differential diagnosis. Now, this, if this is tumor, there shouldn't be any normal basal cells. Exactly. Is there a stain for basal cells in the lung? P63 or P40. Every bit of peribronchiolar metaplasia you've ever seen in your life has a sprinkling of basal cells in the background. And you can highlight them with P63 and P40. And if you don't believe us, try it in your next case and you'll see. And so the, the, the differential comes that when you have a mucinous adenocarcinoma, it does not have any basal cells. So you do your P63, P40, you will have a complete absence. And you might find places where there is peribronchiolar metaplasia with basal cells. So a nice contrast. And internal control. Internal control. What about CDX2? So CDX2 actually I think can be very helpful if it's positive. It should be positive in about 50% of lung adenocarcinomas, mucinous adenocarcinomas, which might be surprising to some people, but 50% of mucinous lung adenocarcinomas will be CDX2 positive. So if you do have CDX2 reactivity in here, that is distinctly abnormal because there's no other reason for you to have CDX2 reactivity in the lung unless you have a mucinous adenocarcinoma, right. either primary or metastatic. Now, the clinician, after uh, I diagnosed this, called and said, um, I've got a problem because I've got a patient with bilateral infiltrates. One side, they're growing. How much of this, how do I stage this patient clinically? I mean, is this all the disease, is mucinous adenocarcinoma? Is it localized? Is it a, uh, a one centimeter, five centimeter? How do we go about staging? Well, we've got the mucinous adenocarcinoma in every section here. Right. And we know that mucinous adenocarcinoma spread throughout the airways, and they often present with multi-lobar involvement. Right. And so this, if, it, if they do have multifocal pneumonias radiographically, then this would be classified with the AJCC, the newest classification, uh, as the pneumonic type mucinous adenocarcinoma. And the stage depends on how many lobes are involved. So you tell the clinician how many lobes in this patient have disease that seems to be progressing radiologically. Right. So this case indeed was CDX2 positive. There was not a single P40 positive basal cell within any of these areas. So this is a patient with UIP of IPF with a secondary mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung. So two lethal diseases, unfortunately, both of which are difficult or it's impossible a, to treat. It's a bad prognos prognosis. Okay. All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for listening and watching. Don't forget to like and comment below.